Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Handsome Baptist Church. It's great to see you. If you would stand with us, we're going to get our day started by singing a little music together. Welcome. We're so glad you're here today. If you're visiting with us, uh, you're our very special guest. We'd love to have a record of your visit, and there should be a, uh, a card on the pew rack in front of you. Um, if you'd like to fill that out, you can just leave it on the pew, put it in one of the four offering boxes uh, sometime during the service or after the service, and we'll get some information to you about our church. Um, I want to say on behalf of my 93-year-old 93 dad, who had uh, uh, pacemaker, sur pacemaker defibrillator surgery on Friday. And by the way, he's here. Thank you for all of your prayers and the many texts uh, asking about how everything was going because it was kind of touch and go. We didn't know for sure the doctor was going to go ahead with it because it started out with a cath, and if the cath proved to be okay, then they would proceed. If not, then they, they would either wait uh, a little while, and we were all hoping that maybe it would all be done, and it was. And, uh, but you need to continue to pray for him, and I'll tell you why. The surgeon comes out, 
pulls me aside and he said, who's Francis? And I said, I, I don't know who Francis is. And he says, well, as he was coming to, he was calling out for Francis. So I went back into the room and I said, Dad, who is Francis? Turns out she was a former girlfriend many years ago. <laughs> now, this is the first time I think I've ever thrown my dad under the bus. I do my mom all the time. But you can, uh, you can ask him about, about Francis. But anyway, please continue to pray. And uh, we're very, very grateful to God. Grateful. Um, okay. We're having today, after the service, a membership inquiry class. And the class is just an inquiry class. We're going to feed lunch. We're going to tell you a little bit about our church. We're going to find out who you are. If you've been coming and you're interested to know more, uh, just meet us over in the fellowship hall after the service, and we'll do the rest. And plan on an hour and a half probably not even that long, but uh, we would love to have you join the group. I think that's it. Bob Bridges, you're up. You know how most of us Baptists, if you've been a Baptist for very long, you don't like the word change. We didn't like change when we had to stop Sunday school a year and a half ago. We didn't like lots and lots of things. Well, we got another change coming up two weeks from today, but this is a good change. We're going to be starting Sunday school again. Many of you are already aware of that. You know that. Uh, I do want to mention a couple of things. I was going to mention some notes about Sunday school, but I see Tom's notes here. You know, you could do a lot of things with somebody's <laughs> notes <laughs> right in front of them even, but I won't do that. Uh, I have not seen this yet. Uh, actually, Sunday school is two weeks from today. What I wanted to mention mainly, the reason I was going to do an announcement, is when we started, or just before we had to stop meeting a year and a half ago, we had just started a new unit in Romans when using our Lifeway material. And my class, and I think Bob's class, is going to do the same thing. We're just going to pick up kind of where we left off. Actually, I'm going to start over because we only had about two or three lessons out of it, and that was a year and a half ago. And even if you remember it, you need it again. So, uh, but here's the point. If you still have your quarterly, is what we used to call them, member's guide, whatever, study school book, you'll need that. I hope some of us still have those. We did contact Lifeway, and they have, get, they have given us permission to make copies. And so my, my first thought was I'll just scan it, email it to anybody who wants it. And Dan said, well, Holly said she would make copies for us you know, using the church copier and whatnot. If you prefer, if you're going to be in my class, or even Bob's class, I guess, and you would like a PDF version sent to your email every week, let me know, or let Holly know. I want to commit Holly to that, so she'll let me know in the office. Uh, if you want a paper copy, we'll have some of those available also. We won't do them all at one time. I don't want to overwhelm her, but uh, we'll have them a couple of weeks in advance because I know a lot of people like to, to get a little start on them. Uh, remember, there is a fellowship meal the same day, uh, two weeks from today. And I thought there was going to be more about Sunday school here, but there's not. So um, that's all I have to say about Sunday school. Let's uh, pray as we get our service going this morning again. Our Father, we are thankful for your love. We're thankful for your faithfulness, your uh, provision for us, not just physically, but more important spiritually, knowing that as we uh, go through this life, no matter the, the good, the bad that we, we face, we know that when we quit breathing here, if we're a child of yours, we'll be in your presence and in your son's presence, and we're thankful for that. As we continue this service now, as Austin and his group leads us, as we sing, as we hear your word, we just ask that your son might be honored and that he might be glorified this morning. And it's in his name that I pray these things. Amen. All right, please stand with us. <clears throat>
We're going to sing softly and tenderly together. It's, it's probably one of my top favorite hymns. And I've gone through the whole history with you guys before. But I had something that I wanted to add to it. Um, softly and Tenderly was written by Will Thompson. He was a, uh, a good friend of D.L. Moody. Everyone knows D.L. Moody. Founded the Moody Church, founded the Moody Bible Institute. And uh, he was inspired to write and preach after listening to D.L. Moody as he was growing up. Uh, but they were friends their entire life. And uh, whenever D.L. Moody laid on his deathbed in Massachusetts, Will Thompson made a special visit just to check on him and his condition. Uh, the physician refused to admit him to a sick room, and uh, D.L. Moody threw a fit. He said he heard him out in the hallway talking just outside the bedroom door, and he recognized uh, Will's voice, and he called for him to come to his bedside. He said he took the Ohio poet composer by the hand, and some of the last words that D.L. Moody said were, Will, I would rather have written softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, than anything I've been able to do in my entire life. So, if you all would join us, we're going to sing this song together.
join me this morning as we return to the book of Daniel. For those of you visiting with us, we've been walking our way through the book of Daniel for some time now, and we're, we're seeing it come to not the grand finale, but almost. Chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Listen to these words. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until till that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Lord, open our eyes. Let us see from your word what you would have us to see. We love the Holy Scriptures and thank you for giving it to us that we can read in our own language. We can understand it. We can work our way through it. Even the hard puzzles in the text that we can sort them out and figure them out. And for the rest, Lord, we just thank you for for those things we don't understand. Thank you for opening our eyes do that today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. From our study thus far of the book of Daniel, there's no doubt, no doubt, that Daniel was concerned about his people, the Jews, about their destiny. We've seen his burden several times, which he needed an angel to revive him, to strengthen him. If you remember in chapter 10, In verse 2, in those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. Daniel had been fasting and praying and concerned about what the visions meant and and what was going to happen to his people. It was was right there at the end of the Babylonian captivity. They were going to be going back to their promised land, fulfilling uh, the scriptures. Daniel was so concerned. And you know, I... I think we can draw out of this the fact that angels, they are messengers. They are God's messengers. And they can be sent to assist us as well. Matter of fact, the book of Hebrews says, Be careful to entertain strangers, whereby some have entertained angels unaware. We're not sure. Angels take on form whenever they need to, but for the most part, It's an invisible thing, both demonic activity and angelic activity. But here this angel comes to Daniel, and he's going to give him two things, two facts that's going to console him. The first one is, he tells him here, your people will be delivered by the intervention of Michael. Look at what it says here. Michael, the great prince, the archangel, who stands guard over the sons of your people. Most scholars believe that Michael was uh, Israel's angel, guardian angel, as it appears in, in chapter 10, verse 13 and 21, even in the book of Jude, verse 9, where he contested with the devil over the body of Moses. He seems to be the one that God has put in charge of Israel. He's giving him this confidence that this great prince, he will arise. He will arise at the time where there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, the book of life, will be rescued. This is the end of the great tribulation. This verse 1 marks the very end of that seven years, three and a half of which Jesus said if they weren't shortened, no one would live. A terrible, terrible time. This is mentioned as early as the book of Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 30 when Moses is writing and he uses the expression, in the latter days. It's mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble. 
Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. And Jesus also talks about this. Matthew chapter 24, starting with verse number 15. He says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, and that's chapter 9 and verse 26, I believe, or 27, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand that those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in the house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But I pray that your flight will not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. The tribulation period is explained in Revelation chapter 6 all the way through chapter 19. It's described with these images, the breaking of the seals, the blowing of the trumpets, the emptying of the bowls of wrath. Revelation also reports that, that in this time of the end of this great tribulation period, that hailstones will fall from the heavens weighing a talent each. A talent is 75 pounds. Imagine the world devastation as this greatest of all finales takes place. This is what verse 1 is talking about, the great tribulation. And it is Michael who is going to come at the end. And Michael is going to, along with the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the way, Calvin believed that Michael the archangel was another name for the Lord Jesus in his pre-incarnate. Uh, that's just a thought to throw out there. He's much smarter than I am, so I'm not going to disagree with him. But I'm just going to call him Michael the archangel, like, like it says. Go with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 in verse 7 to 9. And listen to these words. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil. And Satan, who deceives the whole world, was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. There is a believing remnant of Israel. Revelation tells us it's 144,000 who will be sealed and secured. And during this particular time, for the last half or maybe the entire time, uh, they will be mass evangelists. They will be sealed and hidden away. No doubt Michael the archangel is standing there with him. And during that time, according to Romans eleven twenty six, 26, Paul says, all Israel will be saved. Now, it's not all without extinction. It's all without dis or extinction. It's all without distinction of every tribe of, of Israel. They will be saved. And that is God's plan. The second thing that the, the angel is giving in this, in this prophecy here. The second thing to bring hope to Daniel. And when Daniel sees that when it all comes to pass, we win. Then he's going to give him the second truth. Which is the promise that those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Here he's using a euphemistic word sleep. He could have written the word die in here. So why did he write the word sleep? He was referring to death. And it's because sleep is temporary, right? And death to the believer is temporary. My dad said these words in some words. He said, if I don't awake, it's a win for me. 
If I awake, it's a win for me to go back to 72 years of marriage. Wow. What a statement. Friends, we're going to rise. And I don't know how much you know about this, how much you believe this, how much you feel it in your spirit, in your soul. But we're going to rise, and we will arise from the dust of the ground. And by the way, let me just take a little plug. I hope we don't have any funeral directors here. If we do, I apologize. I did a funeral yesterday. And I'm telling you guys, the, the place was packed, and the side room was packed. Uh, the man had a big, long, white beard. And there were more bearded men in that, in that uh, Barnett Strother than at the last Santa Claus convention. They were everywhere. I mean, the beards this long. And the, the, the ceremony, and I always, I always talk to the, to the uh, funeral director about this because maybe I have some strange ideas about this, but I just believe the body should go back to the ground. From the dust of the earth we are raised. And how can we go back to the ground if we're sealed in some kind of thing that has a 200-year warranty that nothing can get in, including decay? I, I just don't get it. And I asked him, I said, there's, there's other ways, and I know there's cremation, and there's different views on that. There's certainly nothing in the Bible about it. Um, I, do, I will throw this thought out to you because uh, this is kind of a thought I have, and it goes 50% uh, this way, 50% this way, but fire is a, a sign of judgment, but it's also a sign of cleansing and purifying. So it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. You, you choose for yourself. But I asked the funeral director, I said, how can I do it to where my body will go back to the ground without all of these things? And he says, well, first of all, there, there are requirements for where you're buried, floodplain, things like that. You have to be sealed in something. But he said, you can have a green burial. And I said, what? What is a green burial? And that is, if you own some property, I do. You can be buried on that property without anything and await the coming of the Lord. I, I just tell you, and I know there's some hitches to that because you get ready to sell your property. Oh, by the way, uh, <laughs> he's, he's over there. We'll, we'll put a little picket around it where you won't. But anyway, that's just, just a, a footnote here about... Uh, uh, in the dust of the ground they will awake. This is the, the teaching of the resurrection. The resurrection is taught all over the Bible. I heard a Jewish man tell me one time, the only reference in the Bible for any kind of resurrection is this passage here in Daniel verse 2, chapter 12 and verse 2. But upon further study, Abraham believed in the resurrection Genesis 25, 5, as he was taking Isaac up, Isaac up and to offer him as a sacrifice, he knew that he was bringing Isaac back down because he told them, we will worship and we'll come back to you. He believed that even if God allowed him to offer his son on that altar, that resurrection would happen. He considered that God was able to raise people from the dead, and that's mentioned in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10, it talks about Abraham. He was looking for a city. He was content to live in a tent. All of his wanderings, leaving the Earl of the Chaldees, he was content to live in a tent because he knew he had seen that city and he knew that he would be raised to that city. Now, a little personal illustration here. I think this illustrates it. If it doesn't, you just mark it off. But two years ago, um, you guys gave us a study sabbatical, and I chose Siena, Italy. And for two years, uh, every day for six weeks, I uh, had from morning till lunchtime a time of study. And um, it was a wonderful thing. But there were a few surprises. When we got there, the apartment that I'd worked so hard to secure for a year, um, turns out we didn't get that, and we were given another one. Uh, much less. And to make matters even worse, the shower 
was so small, I literally couldn't do this inside the shower. Italians, I don't know if we have any Italians here, but they're thin, handsome people. And we're not, I'm not. But every morning when I stepped into that shower, I didn't complain. And I tried my best not to drop the soap. And I had a smile on my face. Why? Because for two years I had planned this. I had schemed that when we left, the day we left for Italy, a construction crew, Roger started it out, came into my house and completely tore out uh, plaster walls and, and built us a shower that you could bathe a horse in. Every day, Connie knew nothing about this, by the way. Her, final, her last words to me before we left, you're not planning anything, are you? No, honey. Um, so anyway, every morning that, that I did this and was frustrated with the small shower and hitting the sides of it, and I, I just was thinking, you know, it's only going to be six weeks, and we're going to have this fantastic place. That's what Abraham, that's what got Abraham through. He, he knew, he knew God was going to prepare wonderful things for him. And then Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible, written the oldest book in the Bible, chapter 19 and verse 25 and 26, here's what he said. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh, my flesh, I will see God. Job believed in the resurrection. Isaiah, who was a hundred years before Daniel, wrote these words in chapter 26 and verse 19. Your dead will live, their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. <laughs> there's, there's a great day coming. And that day that's coming is going to be the resurrection. Now here is my understanding of how the resurrection takes place. The first example of resurrection that I know of was the bodily resurrection of Christ, including those when Jesus died were raised out of their graves and walked into the city. Now you can find this in Matthew 27 and verse 52. They literally came out of their graves and they walked into town. Now you think about that for a minute. You think about your former wife knocking on your door and his now wife answers the door and she says, who are you? Just imagine all the scenarios about how that would be. But that's a sample, a sample, the first fruit of, of what resurrection was like. The second illustration of resurrection is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. Listen to these words. Now this is speaking about us as believers. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, dead, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. And this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, and if the rapture would happen today, we would be raised. But he goes on and he says, we will not precede those who've fallen asleep. For the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of the God, trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive will rise. I, I don't know how this works. I don't know how. Are we just going to disappear? Um, it, it appears that way. Imagine all the confusion when the church is gone. But that's Another illustration of it in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, and verse number 28. Listen to these words. Verse 28 says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs, remember Lazarus, 
When Jesus stood before the tomb of Lazarus, he called him out. He said, Lazarus, arise. If he had just said, arise, everybody would have, right? But he pointed to that tomb, Lazarus, arise. An hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. There are two ways to live and two ways to die. We must be thinking about this. We don't really like to think about death, but we certainly should be thinking about it. Now when we come to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, this is the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. You say, well, what's the difference? Well, the Old Testament saints remain in the ground until this time. We have the church age. When the rapture comes, only Christians will be resurrected. But then after that period, it starts the seven-year period of the tribulation. And at the end of that period, what we're reading right here, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. The reason why that there's a separation between believers now in Christ being raised and the Old Testament saints waiting until the end of the tribulation to be raised is because they're going to be raised from their graves, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they're going to walk right into the millennial kingdom. And there, as Jesus promised them, where they will be ruling and reigning over all the world for a thousand years. So this, this is another example of the resurrection and the timing of it, if I have it correctly. And then... The fourth example of the resurrection is at the end of the millennium, the end of the thousand years. And here is when I believe the wicked, unrighteous dead will be raised. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over, over these the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. He will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And so here's the picture, I believe, of the unrighteous that will be raised at the very end. There are some questions as we, as we look at some of this, though. And the questions that people ask are, will I have the same body? And most of us say, I hope it's improved, new and improved. Will we know each other? Will we have memories? I mean, how, how could that be? How would that work if, if you get to heaven and you're remembering a loved one that did not make it, did not trust Christ? So these kinds of questions, they do have answers. And some of the answers come out of what we call the resurrection chapter chapter 15 of the book of 1 Corinthians. And beginning with verse number 20, listen to the way Paul explains this. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection in the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, who is first, the first fruits. Maybe, maybe that's a reference to uh, those coming out of the city. I'm not sure. And those that are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end. 
when he hands over the kingdom to God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power, for he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. So here we have this picture of it. But then down to verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else, but God gives it a body just as he wished. And to each of the seeds, a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh. There is one flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly one and the glory of the earthly one is another. There is a glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised imperishable. That imperishable part really interests me because that means there's not going to be any aging. There's not going to be any uh, weakness. Uh, It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So here we have a picture again of the resurrection. And the picture that the questions that people ask. And all of these questions that, that um, uh, leads the Apostle Paul to come to this uh, grand finale in verse 55. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. Here we have a picture We have another verse in Isaiah 65 that says, The former things shall not be remembered. We have a verse in uh, 1 Corinthians 13 that says, We will be known as we are known. Mauricio, I will know you as Mauricio. You'll be much more handsome in those days. But we will know each other. We will have a relationship with each other. You say, well, what about marriage? Oh, me, what about marriage? Because of... Jesus said, it's, there, there's no marriage in heaven. They're like the angels. Well, I don't think God has ever created anything that's disposable. I do not think the family is just going to be dissolved and we're just all, you know, the same. No, no. I think the family is intact. I think marriage is intact. The marriage union will be different because we will be completely complete in and of ourselves with God. I think those relationships are here to stay. That may be wonderful news to you, and it may be news for some of you that maybe you don't like so much. But God has got it all worked out. He's got the resurrection plan. And I I tell you, folks, my prayer, and I told the funeral home guy, I said, my prayer is, is that I can have a green burial, and my body can wait until the time that the Lord Jesus calls. And when he calls, I'm going to rise. Last verse I want to share with you is Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. 21 and verse 4. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. What is my take home for this sermon today? I'm going to rise. When my time comes, my body is put into the ground. I'm going to rise. When the Lord Jesus calls, I am going to rise. Are you? Those of you listening online, are you going to rise? Do you have a certainty when, the, when you die that the Lord Jesus will know your name? He'll only know your name if your name is found in the book of life that has been from the beginning of time. If your name is not in the book of life, you say, Pastor, what, what does that mean? Our names in the book of life. My understanding of that is for the Christian, when you have that moment in your life, when God opens your heart, he quickens your heart. Otherwise, you won't come on your own. We have a disposition to go away from God, not to God. But when he quickens the heart, he gives us that opportunity to do two things. To repent of our sins and to believe in his finished work. To receive his finished work. Salvation is really that simple. A child can understand it. God quickens the heart. The child feels their sin. They know they've wronged God. And they can trust God easier than we can. To say, Jesus, I... I want you to save me. And when that happens, that should be followed by believer's baptism as a public testimony. But baptism doesn't save you. We don't believe that. But we believe that that quickening has to happen. So when that happens, when that time comes, you will rise. You say, how long will it take? Mm, Less than three minutes. I know that because the angel Gabriel that was sent to help Daniel, Daniel's prayer was just about three minutes long. I was told by a Hebrew scholar, if you read it in Hebrew, which reading in Hebrew you have to slow down. Unlike Spanish, you speed up. Three minutes? No, the Bible says, um, absent from the body, what? Present with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. You say, what happens? Do I, do I sleep in the ground until the time? No, your body goes to the ground. Your soul goes to heaven, what we call heaven, the, uh, the abode of God. And your spirit is given a temporary body, a temporary body of, I think it's like a, a body of light. And we will have our physical form, I'm sure of that. But we're going to get these bodies back. Again, God did not create you disposable. He wants you back. He wants your body back. And he wants you to be just like he created you. The second take home from this message is God will fulfill his covenant. Whatever he has promised, he will fulfill it. And here in this Uh, ending of the book of Daniel we see he fulfills that he shows Daniel that that in the the, the final curtain uh, Michael the archangel the Lord Jesus is going to split the Mount of Olives the battle of Armageddon is going to be fought and here we have entering into the millennium the third take home and the last one is if we can trust him For our eternity. Can we trust him for today? I don't know what you're going through. What you're wrestling with. Maybe some of us have burdens and secrets and things that. It's just very, very difficult for us. If we can trust him with our eternity. And not have to worry about death. And not have to worry about uh, judgment. And not have to worry about any of those things. Can we trust him for today and tomorrow, one day at a time? This morning, I I certainly want to extend to you an invitation to repent of your sins 
and to place your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. In these few moments of quiet, as we just want to ruminate on what we've heard, think about what the Spirit of God is speaking to you about. Maybe it's time for you to pray the sinner's prayer. And if it's time, do it in these quiet moments. And then let us know the wonderful news. We're not going to call you down publicly. You're, you're welcome to come anytime. But this is something you decide right where you are. And then come and tell us so that we can lead you into the baptismal waters. Think about these things.
Amen, guys. Thank you, guys. You guys really, really uh, sang good today. And your response, I appreciate it so much for your listening and following. And um, we're almost to the end of our journey of Daniel. And I don't know yet where we're going for sure. I have an idea, but when we finish Daniel. Uh, but whatever it will be, it will be God's word. And it will be verse by verse. And it will be... Um, trying to explain simply what the Bible says and what it means by what it says. Um, I'm going to be taking a few days off this week, and as a result, uh, I've asked Mauricio to preach for us, no pressure, next Sunday. So you, you, you do not want to miss this. I'm going to be here, but I'll just be out of uh, the office uh, most of the week, I'll probably all of the week. And um, so look forward to seeing you next Lord's Day. And uh, Wednesday night is coming couple of weeks uh, where we'll be able to meet again on Wednesdays and have our connect groups and uh, just get our sort of our church schedule back and I'll ch I know churches are I talk to pastors all the time and we're all we're all just anticipating re the return and we never know we just never know when something's going to happen and and we have to back our plans up and we're willing to do that but um, but uh, I'm really excited about what's going to be developing here all right, let's close, shall we, with our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye. and have a wonderful week.